In Bruce Waldke's exposition, he discusses the unifying central message integral to the Old Testament. He offers an allegory comparing how his son's prayers transitioned from specific to general, which illustrates the human tendency to find universality in particulars. He draws a parallel to the role of theologians in condensing the varied and intricate revelations of the Bible into abstract, encompassing themes. Earlier chapters of Waltke's work argue for the purpose of biblical theology as a means of extracting and interpreting a core message across the scripture narratives. This central message, according to Waltke, is the idea of a sovereign, holy, and merciful God whose rule breaks into human history, a force against both earthly and spiritual opposition, balancing judgment with salvation. Waltke grounds the core message in the Old Testament on the glorification of God. He has established his rule on earth through Jesus Christ and his covenant with the people. This is reflected in the Lord's Prayer, which concisely encapsulates the idea of your kingdom come, an invocation for the advancement of God's kingdom and the overthrow of the evil one. This petition is a foundation for understanding the relationship between the Testament of Israel's God and Jesus Christ of the New Testament, showing a world in opposition ultimately redeemed by God's purposeful actions in history, including the choosing of His people according to His own will. God, in His mercy, elects sinners to be His people, expressed through faith and obedience, and enters into covenants with them, an interaction unique to Him. Conversely, he unleashes wrath on those rebelling against him, establishing his rule through significant biblical covenants. The chapter emphasizes that all Old Testament covenants culminate in Jesus Christ. Christ's miracles, resurrection, and sacrificial love show the eternal kingdom's power and nature. Entry into God's kingdom requires a profound faith in Jesus, one that involves discipleship. Waltke aims to validate that the overarching theme of God establishing His merciful reign serves as the connective tissue that links the diverse textual materials of the Bible. Also, Waltke's discussion on the primary history offers an analysis of the narrative thread that binds together the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. He identifies that the unifying elements of this history revolve around significant moments and key patriarchal figures that establish the framework of Israel's theological and historical identity. These events include the creation, fall, flood, the time of the patriarchs, the exodus conquest, establishment of the monarchy, the era of prophecy, and the exile, culminating in the return from Babylonian captivity. Waltke contends that the pivotal events within this sacred history are often associated with crises of faith, times when the experiences of the people of God starkly challenged their existing beliefs and understandings. Communities faced with such crises typically react in one of three ways, by retreating to traditionalism, by discarding their historical frameworks altogether, or by reinterpreting their foundational ideologies to incorporate the new realities they face. Israel's history shows a pattern of reinterpretation and progression, with each epoch being linked to figures who epitomized faith and represented God's divine initiatives. These individuals include Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Joshua, and into the monarchy figures like David, followed by prophets such as Elijah, Elisha, and the later writing prophets, and eventually leaders like Ezra and Nehemiah during the time of the return. Transitioning to the New Testament, Waltke accentuates that Jesus Christ embodies the ultimate transformation of Israel's concept of the kingdom of God. Through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus reshapes messianic expectations into the reality of a transcendent spiritual kingdom guided by the Holy Spirit. This monumental shift in understanding prompts theologians to distinguish between the Old and New Testaments, with the former reflecting the preparatory phase leading up to Christ's coming. The New Testament era is characterized by the founders of the Church, Jesus as the cornerstone and the apostles, especially Peter and Paul, as the builders of the new covenantal community. They lay the foundation for Christianity and provide the theological and doctrinal substance that comes to define the New Testament scriptures. Thus, the Church emerges as the Israel of God, a community that is an extension of the faith heritage of the Old Testament patriarchs, reconstituted in Christ. Waltke illustrates the continuation of God's story through these distinct yet connected testaments, revealing the enduring nature of God's relationship with humanity.
Moreover, Waltke's discussion on the founding covenants in the religion of Israel affirms their unique nature and pivotal role in shaping the historical narrative and the theological framework of the faith. These covenants represent key interactions between God or I Am and key figures such as Eve, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. Each covenant is marked by specific promises and responsibilities, shaping the moral and ethical obligations of God's people. Waltke asserts that the concept of a covenant between a deity and a people group is remarkably unique to Israelite religion, as supported by Moshe Weinfeld's scholarship. These covenants are combinations of unconditional promises, relying on God's fidelity, and conditional ones that depend on human response. The covenants serve different purposes. To Eve, God unconditionally pledged the coming of an offspring who would defeat the adversary, signifying the initial promise of redemption. With Noah, God unconditionally promised never to destroy the earth by flood again, affirming the continuation of life on earth. Abraham received an unconditional promise of descendants and a homeland due to his faithfulness, marking the beginning of a chosen people and their place in the world. Through Moses, the Israelites received a conditional covenant where blessings were contingent on their adherence to God's laws. The Davidic covenant promised an everlasting royal lineage and kingdom as a result of David's faithfulness establishing a line of kingship. The prophetic writings of figures like Jeremiah cast a vision of a future epic where these covenants culminate in a renewed, universal rule of God, established through a new covenant. This envisioned future would be brought about by an obedient servant whom Christians believe to be Jesus, who would facilitate God's kingdom through his life, death, and resurrection, bringing hearts in line with God's will. Each original covenant is accompanied by symbols that memorialize and reincorporate the past into present consciousness. Eve's seed, Noah's rainbow, Abraham's circumcision, the Sabbath of the Mosaic Covenant, and the cup of the New Covenant. These icons convey the enduring message of God's unfolding kingdom. Waltke highlights that the covenant idea encapsulates Israel's firm belief in a unique relationship with God. This unique relationship exists because God elected Israel and initiated a series of relational agreements that would progressively reveal and establish His kingdom through a chosen people. Furthermore, in The Call of Abraham, Genesis 12, 1-3, Waltke posits that this pivotal narrative serves as a lens through which the central message of the Bible can be discerned. This passage records God's call to Abraham and lays out seven specific promises that underpin the divine plan for humanity a plan Waltke identifies as the eruption of God's kingdom on earth. The promises indicate the beginning of a new divine act in history, starting with the nomadic patriarch Abraham. Waltke explains these promises as a progression of revelation and blessing. Abraham is to leave his family, become the progenitor of a great nation, and ultimately facilitate the extension of God's blessing to all nations of the earth. This sequence represents a restoration of God's blessings upon creation and a parallel to the blessings that followed the catastrophe of Noah's flood. Abraham becomes the conduit for divine blessing, but this role hinges on his descendants adhering to moral laws, thereby assuming a central role in God's kingdom. In addition, Waltke deconstructs the idea of a nation into four elements, a common people, common land, common law, and a common ruler. In the case of Israel, special emphasis is placed on these elements as they collectively facilitate the establishment of God's kingdom. Distinctly, Israel's relationship with God differs from other nations, defined by a personal covenant with the divine, positioning Israel as the Creator's chosen instruments in history. The Genesis narrative focuses on identifying God, His chosen people, and the promised land, while the remaining books of the Pentateuch and the Deuteronomic history elucidate the law given to guide the people, the journey to the land, and the leadership that will enforce the law, sustain possession of the land, and ensure victory over foes. Waltke concludes by citing theologian Graham Goldsworthy, who characterizes Genesis 12, 1 3 as an archetype for the unfolding narrative of divine salvation history. This passage promises the development of a chosen people, a land for them to inhabit, a place to manifest a profound covenantal relationship with God, and through this nation, bless all the earth. Thus, the call of Abraham delineates the conception of God's kingdom, where his people thrive in God's place under his sovereign law, acting as a source of blessing for the whole world. 
Further, in his discourse on the typological significance of the Garden of Eden, Waltke explores the idea that the Eden narrative is not an isolated account but rather a template that prefigures the saga of Israel's history as presented in the primary history. He indicates that God's pattern of dealing with humanity starts with creating a designated people and a place for them, which entails giving them a land and a law and appointing leadership in the form of kingship. Eden is thus the first instance of this divine arrangement, with Adam and Eve serving as the initial recipients of God's law and land, while also being entrusted with rulership over creation. Their subsequent disobedience and the resulting exile mirror the later experiences of the nation of Israel, which also fails to uphold God's laws, leading to the corruption of their kings and ultimately their exile. Waltke notes that these narratives are intertwined conceptually, reflected in the themes of creation, law, land, kingship, rebellion, and exile. In his analysis, he urges caution, as the scriptures do not explicitly connect these stories through specific terminology or direct references, leaving the typological relationship open to interpretational nuances rather than dogmatic assertions. The metaphor of a musical composition portrays the Eden story as the opening strains in a grand orchestral piece. It introduces the key themes and motifs that will re-emerge and develop throughout subsequent biblical narratives, particularly those concerning the nation of Israel. As the history of Israel unfolds, it echoes the initial melody of Eden, expanding upon the themes of sin, judgment, and the hope for redemption. Besides, Waltke maintains the role of the Eden narrative in establishing the human condition. The failure of Adam and Eve to obey a single divine command points out the struggle and the impossibility of a people tainted by original sin to follow God's laws in their own strength. This sets the stage for the central issue within the Old Testament, reiterating humanity's need for God's empowerment to maintain a covenant relationship. Concluding his examination, Waltke contrasts the Old Testament focus on law with the New Testament's offering of hope and empowerment through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The resolution of the Old Testament's narrative tension lies in the advent of these New Testament figures, who provide the means to overcome sin and fulfill the long-awaited restoration of God's kingdom. Additionally, Waltke delves into the structure, authorship, and purpose of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, repeating its integral nature and the overarching historical narrative it presents. These books, known within the Jewish tradition as the Torah and referred to as the Book of Moses in post-exilic periods, were traditionally attributed to Moses as the author, an attribution supported by various textual citations throughout the Bible. Splitting the text into five scrolls, a practice dating back to at least the New Testament times, reflects logistical constraints rather than theological divisions. While the exact division may have varied originally, Waltke sees no reason to dispute the long-standing tradition. The author of the Pentateuch is identified as a historian and a poet, merging the lineage of Israel with an instructive ideology aiming to shape Israel's national identity. Moses, due to his exceptional education, spiritual gifts, and direct command from God, is believed to have penned the foundational content of the Pentateuch during Israel's wilderness wanderings. This included the recording of foundational covenants with earlier biblical figures, and the promulgation of diverse directives that spanned religious, political, and social facets of Israelite life. Moses is portrayed as a figure who instructs Israel on its history, destiny, and the laws, such as the Ten Commandments and various liturgical and societal regulations necessary for living as a community under Yahweh's sovereignty. Waltke also accounts for how Moses, in addition to creating original material, deftly incorporated and edited pre-existing traditions and sources into the cohesive narrative of the Pentateuch, rather than simply patching together disparate texts. Discussing further insights, Waltke references the work of David Kleins and John Salehamer to shed light on the Pentateuch's thematic messages and narrative patterns. This includes the portrayal of the divine promises made to the patriarchs, which exhibit a dialectic of fulfillment and non-fulfillment underlined within the arc of the biblical story. Importantly, the Pentateuch not only recounts Israel's foundation and legislation, but also encompasses prophetic elements that anticipate Israel's eventual failure to keep the Sinaitic covenant, followed by divine redemption and the rise of a messianic figure. Thus, Waltke articulates a vision of the Pentateuch that combines history, instruction, and eschatologic hope, 
underscoring the unfolding of God's kingdom throughout the vicissitudes of Israel's experience. Also, Waltke provides an analysis of the Deuteronomistic history, a theological interpretation of Israel's history from Deuteronomy to two kings, which is crucial to the broader biblical narrative known as the primary history. At the heart of this history is the book of Deuteronomy, which Waltke regards as the pivotal connection between the laws of the Pentateuch and the historical and prophetic books that follow. In his view, Deuteronomy captures Moses' final exhortations to the Israelites, pushing the new generation to stay true to their covenant with God to secure prosperity and divine favor. Following Deuteronomy, the book of Joshua recounts the story of the Israelites who, under Joshua's faithful leadership, take possession of the promised land in adherence to God's covenant. However, the period of the judges illustrates a cyclical pattern of apostasy, suffering, and deliverance, signifying a repeated departure from covenant loyalty. Waltke indicates how the nation's survival is contingent upon the rise of judges, charismatic leaders like Othniel, Ehud, and others, who save Israel when they stray from God's statutes. The historical narrative continues with the books of Samuel, where Samuel emerges as the final judge and anoints David as king, establishing a monarchy that embodies the hope of an everlasting kingdom promised by God. Yet, the books of Kings recount how David's successors fail to uphold their covenantal responsibilities, resulting in political fragmentation and, ultimately, the exile of the Israelites. Despite the repeated failures and the presence of both heroes and anti-heroes in this saga, Waltke stresses the immutable nature of God's promises to Abraham and to David. The eternal covenant with David offers a glimpse of hope amid the consequences of the national disobedience. Through this history, Waltke sees a demonstrative pattern of divine sovereignty and grace, where God's commitment to His promises underpins the turbulent narrative of Israel's quest for a kingdom in alignment with God's ultimate reign. Moreover, Waltke's exposition on the post-exilic literature of Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah elaborates on the integral themes and theological reflections that underpin these narratives within the broader context of the kingdom of God. He draws upon the insights of scholars such as Richard Pratt, who identifies the central themes in the chronicler's work as encompassing the people of God, the roles of the king and temple, and the correlation between divine blessing and judgment with Israel's fidelity to its covenant obligations. Such themes are intrinsic to understanding how the community perceives its divine mandate and communal identity. Referencing Mark Thronvite, Waltke emphasizes that post-exilic Israel, despite having transformed through the crucible of exile, sought to establish institutions that would uphold and convey the ancestral promise and identity that characterized the nation before its displacement. These institutions needed to be perceived as legitimate successors so as to provide continuity with the past, a critical assurance for the community's identity and promise. Waltke outlines seven theological principles foundational to the restoration ethos of the Judean community. First, the returning exiles of Jerusalem are seen as the legitimate continuation of Israel, with political recognition from Persian authority. Second, the rebuilt temple and its priesthood are in direct succession to the first temple, again sanctioned by Persia. Third, the covenant relationship between God and Israel persists, along with its blessings and duties. Fourth, the community's foundation rests on a heartfelt adherence to the law of Moses. Fifth, priests and scribes are established as the authoritative interpreters of the law, influencing both governance and the populace. Sixth, the community must be inclusive of all Israel while excluding idolatry, with Ezra and Nehemiah's resistance accentuating their commitment to communal purity. Seventh, to foster endurance, the community must engage in integrity with foreign powers, maintain covenant loyalty to God, and foster unity in their divine mission. Culminating the Restoration period around 430 BC, the narrative concludes with a vibrant, devout community within the now hallowed walls of Jerusalem, with the holiness emanating to neighboring regions. Yet expectation lingered as they awaited an even greater fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Through this exploration, Waltke reveals that these post-exilic texts are not mere historical records, but are deeply interwoven with the emergent theme of God's unfolding kingdom. Furthermore, Waltke's exposition on prophetic literature in the Bible offers a deep insight into how God communicates and interacts with His people, particularly Israel, through prophets.
These prophets, inspired by God's Spirit, serve a pivotal role in interpreting Israel's history and experiences under the light of God's covenants. Central to their message are two dominant themes, the immediate consequences of Israel's covenantal failures and the future hope anchored in God's mercy. The first theme addresses the nation's egregious failure to live up to the obligations of the Sinaitic covenant. The prophets, in their doom oracles, frequently target Israel's leadership, condemning their immorality and injustice. This criticism reflects a broader societal failure to adhere to the covenant standards, inevitably leading to God's judgment and punishment. An example of this is found in Micah 3, 1, 5, where the leaders are admonished for their failure in ensuring justice, thus inviting divine retribution. However, the prophetic narrative isn't solely about doom and despair. Waltke affirms a second equally significant theme, the promise of salvation and a future filled with hope. Despite Israel's present failures, the prophets also speak of a time when God, in His mercy, will restore and redeem. This future vision is rooted in the Abrahamic covenant, promising forgiveness, compassion, and a renewed relationship with God. The Messianic age, characterized by peace and justice, is a key element in this prophecy, as depicted in passages like Micah 7, 18, 20, and Isaiah 2, 2, 4. This era is envisioned as a time when nations will turn away from war and strife, symbolizing a universal peace under God's reign. In summarizing Waltke's analysis, it becomes clear that the prophetic literature is intricately woven around the concept of God's kingship. The prophets present a dual aspect of salvation history, the current age marked by failure and divine judgment, and a forthcoming age of triumph and universal kingship. This future kingdom will dissolve the distinction between God's sovereignty over all creation and His reign over the wills of His subjects, culminating in a universal kingdom encompassing all nations. Through this lens, the prophetic messages in the Bible can be seen as not just reflections on historical events, but as profound declarations of God's ultimate plan for humanity and the entire world. In addition, in his analysis of apocalyptic literature, particularly focusing on the book of Daniel, Waltke asserts the distinct ways in which the prophetic and apocalyptic visions present the eschatological kingdom of God. Prophetic literature traditionally views this kingdom as emerging from history, specifically through a descendant of David, aligning with the Jewish expectation of a Davidic Messiah. In contrast, apocalyptic literature portrays a more transcendent intervention, envisioning the kingdom of God as inaugurated by a divine figure, the Son of Man, who arrives in a dramatic heavenly fashion. The book of Daniel is a prime example of this apocalyptic vision. Its first six chapters contain historical narratives that demonstrate the absolute sovereignty of God in the affairs of nations. These stories are rich with miraculous interventions, such as Daniel and his friends being saved from the fiery furnace and the lion's den. These events are symbolic of God's protection and favor towards those who remain steadfast in their faith and loyalty to Him. The latter chapters of Daniel, chapters 7 through 12, shift focus to visions that expand upon these themes, particularly regarding Israel's future and the eschatological hope. Here, the persecution under Antiochus IV the Epiphanes is foretold, portraying a time of severe trial for the faithful, but also assuring divine intervention and ultimate victory. This part of Daniel also prophesizes the coming of Jesus Christ, who is seen as the one to overthrow earthly kingdoms and establish an eternal kingdom characterized by righteousness and peace. Waltke highlights that despite their differences, both prophetic and apocalyptic visions share a common understanding of salvation history. They perceive history as divided into the current age and the forthcoming age. In this future age, God's sovereignty will be manifested perfectly, unifying His universal and particular reigns. This perspective indicates a central theme in both prophetic and apocalyptic literature, the certainty of divine sovereignty and the ultimate deliverance and vindication of the faithful. Further, Waltke's analysis of the hymnic literature in the Psalms presents a detailed understanding of its structure and theological themes. The Psalms are organized into five distinct books, each with its unique focus and progression. The compilation begins with Psalms 1, 2, setting the stage for the themes and motifs to be explored. Psalm 1 maintains the blessedness of those who live under God's rule, and Psalm 2 introduces the central theme of the entire collection, the praying king, linked to the Davidic covenant, portraying him as a divinely appointed son of God. 
The role of the Messiah, or the Anointed One, is particularly pointed out at key transitional points in the Psalter. The first three books, Psalms 1, 89, are dominantly royal, revolving around the Davidic covenant, God's protection of the king, and prayers for the king's righteous reign. This part of the Psalter is marked by a progression from the introduction of the Davidic covenant in Psalm 2 to the detailed prayers for the king's rule in Psalm 72. Book 3, however, represents a darker phase where the Davidic covenant seems broken, culminating in the despairing cry of Psalm 89. This despair and sense of brokenness in Book 3 contrasts with Book 4, where the focus shifts from earthly kingship to God as the eternal king. This section recalls Israel's history, particularly the role of Moses, and contains the enthronement psalms, which reiterate God's timeless kingship and his role as a refuge for Israel. Book 5 continues the themes of Book 4, but with a shift towards restoration and hope. It begins with an acknowledgment of God's gathering of His people, reflecting a post-exilic context. The messianic hope is also more pronounced, especially in Psalm 110, where David envisions a future king who will be a powerful, priestly ruler. Overall, Waltke's exposition of the Psalms repeats the central theme of divine rule through David and his descendants. It navigates through various emotional landscapes, from assurance and praise to despair and hope, ultimately affirming that despite the king's present tribulations, God's purposes for him and the chosen nation will be fulfilled. In addition, Waltke's exploration of wisdom literature in the Bible centers on the pivotal concept of the fear of I am, Yerat Yahweh, particularly within the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. This notion is crucial for understanding the essence of wisdom as portrayed in these texts. In Proverbs, the fear of I am is depicted as the foundation of wisdom. This comparison suggests that wisdom, much like music or reading, is rooted in fundamental principles, with the fear of I am being indispensable to its understanding. The book of Job further develops this idea, presenting wisdom as beyond human purchase or comprehension. It's portrayed as a divine revelation, not something to be attained through earthly endeavors. Ecclesiastes, through the teachings of Koheleth, boils down wisdom to the fear of God and obedience to His commandments. This is presented as the ultimate duty of humanity with an emphasis on the understanding that all actions are subject to divine judgment. Waltke elaborates that the fear of I am encompasses both rational and emotional dimensions. The rational aspect involves an objective understanding of God's laws and commandments, serving as a moral guide for human conduct. This fear is not only a matter of adherence to a set of rules, but also motivates moral behavior in situations where there may be no external enforcement of these morals. On the emotional side, the fear of I am entails a deep, effective response that includes fear, love, and trust in God. This dual nature of fear and love is consistently illustrated in biblical texts. The wise, as per Waltke's interpretation, accept this revelation with a sense of awe and reverence towards God. This reverence is not solely based on fear, but is balanced with love, forming a comprehensive faith-based relationship with God. In summary, Waltke presents the fear of I am as a complex and multifaceted concept that is fundamental to understanding biblical wisdom. It's a blend of rational acknowledgement of God's commandments and an emotional, faith-driven response to His presence and authority. Further, Waltke's examination of other literature in the context of biblical theology gives particular emphasis to three books, Lamentations, Esther, and Song of Songs. His focus on Lamentations is especially noteworthy, since it isn't extensively discussed elsewhere in his theology. The Book of Lamentations stands out as a profound expression of grief, believed to be authored by Jeremiah, capturing the sorrowful aftermath of Jerusalem's destruction and its temple's fall. This work comprises five lament psalms, the first four of which follow an acrostic pattern, a literary form that serves a therapeutic function. This pattern allows the writer to express a spectrum of emotions, ranging from the depths of despair to glimmers of hope encapsulating the entire experience of grief. The significance of Lamentations, as analyzed by Waltke, lies in its portrayal of emotional states associated with suffering. The book oscillates between despair and hope, anger and solace, reflecting the complex emotional journey of the sufferers. Waltke identifies three essential perspectives within the text. 
Firstly, the destruction and exile of Israel are portrayed as just repercussions for the nation's transgressions, a theme echoed in Lamentations 1.18. Secondly, the text reveals a palpable emotional resistance to God's judgment on Judah, as seen in Lamentations 3.43. Besides, there is an expression of hope and faith that the exile will eventually end, and there will be retribution against Judah's enemies, as expressed in Lamentations 3.22, 23. These elements underline the book's central theme, the sovereignty of God over all nations and His unwavering commitment to His covenant promises. This perspective contrasts sharply with the approach seen in Mesopotamian city laments, where destruction is often attributed to the unpredictable will of capricious gods. In Lamentations, the fall of Jerusalem is seen not as an arbitrary act, but as a deliberate move by a sovereign deity, actively working to establish His rule on earth through Israel. This view of God's sovereignty and faithfulness amidst suffering offers a unique theological insight into the nature of divine justice and mercy. Additionally, Waltke dives into the biblical narrative of Esther, situated in the period of the Persian Empire. Waltke underscores the overarching theme of God's sovereignty and providential care, particularly in the context of the Jewish people. The story of Esther is presented as a testament to God's mysterious and inscrutable ways of governing the world, especially in times of uncertainty and danger for His covenant people. In the narrative, the Jewish people living in exile face imminent destruction due to the machinations of their enemies. This threat of annihilation represents a critical moment in their history, where their very existence is at stake. Waltke emphasizes that, in this dire context, the story of Esther showcases a dramatic reversal of fortunes, orchestrated by God's providence. This reversal is not just a mere turn of events, but is deeply symbolic of God's faithful commitment to His people. The book of Esther, while not explicitly mentioning God, demonstrates His presence through the unfolding events. Esther, a Jewish woman who becomes queen, and her cousin Mordecai play pivotal roles in this divine plan. Through a series of intricate and seemingly coincidental events, they are able to thwart the plans of Haman, the antagonist who seeks to destroy the Jewish people. Also, Waltke accentuates the significance of the Amalekites, represented by Haman, who is descended from this ancient enemy of Israel. The narrative of Esther thus fulfills a deeper historical and theological theme in the Hebrew Bible— the obliteration of the memory of Amalek as God had intended for Israel since its inception. This aspect affirms the story's importance not only as a historical account, but also as a fulfillment of divine justice and promise. In summary, Waltke's interpretation of the book of Esther presents it as a profound example of God's unseen hand at work. It asserts the themes of deliverance, divine justice, and the fulfillment of God's promises— even amidst the unpredictable and often hostile circumstances of human history. Moreover, in his examination of the Song of Songs, Waltke confronts the challenge of integrating this erotically charged love poetry into a broader theological framework. The Song of Songs is a dialogue between lovers, expressing their mutual affection in deeply sensuous language. Waltke breaks the book into four distinct segments. The initial desire for love, a bride's daydream, the reciprocal affection and yearning, and finally, the profound worth of love in unity. The traditional allegorical approach to the song, espoused by Jewish and Christian interpreters, posits that the woman and man symbolize God and His people or Christ and the Church, respectively. Yet, Waltke highlights that such a reading is without explicit allegorical markers, making it speculative as opposed to purposeful allegories like John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Considering the similarities with other ancient Near Eastern love poems, some modern interpretations view the song merely as an ode to human love, thus dismantling the dichotomy between spirituality and physical desire, commonly perceived through a neoplatonic lens. Franz de Litch presents a dramatic two-character analysis wherein the love story concerning Solomon and the Shulamite stands as an emblem of monogamous devotion against the backdrop of Solomon's polygamy. Waltke favors an interpretation by Ian Pravan, among others, which understands the song as poetic drama that celebrates the maiden's unadulterated affection for her shepherd lover over King Solomon's luxurious advances, suggesting Solomon's negative portrayal. This interpretation posits Solomon's realization that simple, bucolic love surpasses the opulent but hollow love he encountered in his later years, reflecting perhaps his own journey from an idealistic love to the disillusionment of harem life. 
Waldke ultimately advocates for a typological interpretation of the song, resonant with the Old Testament metaphor of God as husband and Israel as bride. With New Testament inclusion, this image extends to the relationship between Christ and the Church, as Apostle Paul illustrates matrimonial unity as a mystery that conveys Christ's bond with the Church. Thus, in this theological reading, the Song of Songs transcends the celebration of earthly love, offering a deeper revelation of God's passionate, covenantal love for His people and their consecration to Him. Furthermore, Waltke's analysis of the New Testament view on the kingdom of God begins with John the Baptist, who sets the stage for the coming of the Messiah and the anticipated eschatological kingdom, a time that would signify the salvation of the righteous and the judgment of the wicked according to the prophecies of the Old Testament. This kingdom would be both a continuation of God's reign through Israel's history and an entirely new manifestation in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is portrayed as the embodiment of the kingdom of God. His incarnation, ministry, and specifically His resurrection signal the closing of this age and the advent of the age to come. With Jesus at its center, the kingdom is not just a future expectation but a present reality. Jesus' response to the Pharisees indicates that the kingdom of God exists among them, and the call to repentance is immediate and personal. In addition, Jesus redefined messianic expectations from a conquering political figure to one demanding a repentance that centered on faith and the rejection of a religion focused solely on outward appearances and practices. A true disciple is someone who seizes Jesus and his teachings with a radical trust, even to the point of strife and division among close relationships. Jesus' parables are central to communicating the mystery of the kingdom, that is, its presence in history before its ultimate apocalyptic revelation. This kingdom grows discreetly and must be accepted willingly. The ultimate separation of believers, wheat and unbelievers, tares, will occur at the end times, with the righteous inheriting God's kingdom. Further, Waltke details how John's Gospel and the Book of Acts contribute to this understanding of the kingdom. John focuses on the present reality of eternal life through faith in Jesus and fellowship with God, and Acts chronicles the Spirit-filled birth and spread of the Church, the communal witness to God's kingdom. Paul maintains the Church as now residing spiritually with Christ in heavenly places while physically enduring this age, reflecting the kingdom and awaiting Christ's return with hope. In summary, Waltke paints a New Testament picture where the kingdom of God is both presently operative within the community of believers and also awaits its complete future fulfillment, necessitating a faith that is both active in the present and hopeful toward the future. Last but not least, Waltke, in his analysis of the overarching biblical narrative, centers on the consistency of God's sovereign will throughout the Old and New Testaments. The Old Testament, he debates, is not just a record of ancient history, but a series of divine interventions leading to the advent of Jesus Christ. Waltke sees the establishment of God's kingdom as the primary drive behind both the scriptural narrative and history itself. Waltke posits that the concept of the kingdom of God contains both already and not yet elements, where the realization of Israel's physical kingdom in the Old Testament foreshadows the true and more profound kingdom ushered in by Christ. This kingdom in its fullest sense awaits its consummation in the new heaven and earth promised in Revelation. He elucidates how the key themes of seed, law, land, and king find their ultimate expression in Jesus. The seed of Abraham is revealed as more spiritual than physical, transcending ethnic boundaries by faith. The law given through Moses is newly conceived as a covenant etched on the hearts of Christ's followers by the Holy Spirit. The promised land is no longer a mere geographic location, but expands in Jesus Christ as a present spiritual reality that offers rest and life with the future physical reality of a new creation yet to come. The Davidic king is transformed from a temporal earthly ruler to the divine heavenly King Jesus, who triumphs over evil not by force but through his sacrificial death and resurrection. He points out that despite the passage of time, neither God's intent to establish his kingdom nor the impediments to it, the hardness of human hearts and Satan's deceit have changed. However, the outcome is sure because of Christ's unfailing obedience. The storylines of creation, fall, and redemption are brought to their conclusion in Jesus Christ, who, particularly in Paul's letters, is depicted as reconciling heaven and earth through his sacrificial act. 
In an evocative comparison of Genesis with Revelation, Waltke illustrates the scriptural unity and God's redemptive plan unfolding from a paradise lost to a paradise regained. The comparisons reiterate the transformation from chaos to order, from curse to blessing, from mortality to immortality, repeating the totality of cosmic redemption that awaits the consummation of God's kingdom. In essence, God's redemptive activity throughout the Bible is done with the intent that humanity might eternally glorify Him, showcasing His glory through the praises of His redeemed people, as underlined by prophets and apostles alike. In conclusion, Waltke's theological exposition on the Old Testament centers on conveying the essential message of the Bible, which, according to him, is the concept of the kingdom of God established by a divine, sovereign, and gracious ruler. This kingdom breaks into human history to subvert both human and spiritual opposition, advancing salvation and upholding justice. Additionally, Waltke outlines the development of this kingdom through significant covenants made between God and key figures such as Abraham, Moses, and David. Each covenant carries specific promises and obligations shaping the narrative of Israel's identity and mission. The covenant with Abraham sets forth God's plan to make a great nation through him, while the Mosaic covenant stipulates a legal framework for living under God's rulership. The Davidic covenant pledges an everlasting kingdom, which Waltke interprets as finding ultimate fulfillment in the New Testament through the coming of Jesus Christ. Also, prophetic literature plays an integral role in this kingdom narrative, as prophets interpret Israel's historical experiences through the lens of divine chastisement and future redemption. Despite their condemnation of Israel's unfaithfulness, prophets also convey hope for a restored and blessed future. Moreover, Waltke's study doesn't shy away from encompassing other biblical genres. Hymnic literature in the Psalms celebrates divine kingship, wisdom literature advocates a life lived in the fear of God, and books like Lamentations, Esther, and Song of Songs deepen the understanding of God's sovereign care, justice, and covenantal love. Furthermore, transitioning to the New Testament, Waltke identifies John the Baptist as signifying the impending establishment of God's kingdom, which Jesus embodies. According to Waltke, Jesus represents the divine kingdom's arrival, teaching repentance and inaugurating a new covenant era characterized by his followers living in allegiance to his teachings. In summary, Waltke connects the Old and New Testament within a singular divine narrative of the kingdom of God, merging the anticipatory stories of the old with the messianic fulfillment in the new. The kingdom of God is understood to be progressively revealed in history and finally consummated in Christ, thus harmonizing the diverse elements of the biblical text into a coherent story of divine reign and human salvation.